Um, as before, I don't have a particularly in-depth uh, theoretical introduction because I haven't read the papers of them, but comments from before stand about being quite pleased to know these two people well um, and to kind of have them be a big continual part of most of intellectual and personal life. Uh, I mean, the one, not when I met them, it's a boring story, but I will say that having gotten to know them both better at Cornell last year, where I met Adrian and some other people, you know, I had one of the better conversations I've sort of had in my life. It's continued about sort of grayness and sludgy neutrality and things that sort of hung on and remained, I think, for the three of us in different ways, a sort of uh, constant preoccupation with a certain form of failed negativity that remains in different, different sort of forms um, a major part of our thinking. So uh, not, I'll, I'll let them kind of speak about what they're going to do. Two forms, I think, of this in very different versions. So the more formal thing from their, their bios, best of interest, Nathan Brown, partially responsible for all of us being here today, is also an assistant professor uh, of English at UC Davis, where he teaches in science and technology studies and the program of critical theory. He's published in content of philosophy, nanotech, and experimental poetry, and key parallel or ethical philosophy, parallax, how-to, and the speculative turn, the book form. He's currently working on two book projects, The Limits of Fabrication, Material Science, and Materialist Poetics which examines concepts of form and practices of fabrication in nanoscale material science and contemporary materials and poetics. And on the more fun book, uh, Absent the Wax, Rationalist Empiricism, reconsiders the relation of rationalism and empiricism in light of recent challenges to Kant's critical resolution of this problem, with particular attention to contemporary French rationalism, Althusser, Badiou, Mayassou, and various radical empiricisms, Peirce, Whitehead, and Deleuze. Uh, Nathan will be speaking first on the lucidity, the unliving crystallography and inorganic poetry behind me. And while I'm here, uh, as for Alexei Kuklievich, uh, received his PhD in philosophy from Villanova. He's currently a researcher at the Jan van Eyck. Uh, his publications address the work of figures such as Althusser, Deleuze, uh, Badiou, and Jacques Rancière. He's the co founder of Machete, a collective experiment attempting uh, to engender critical points of antagonism within the contemporary artistic conjuncture. He's also working on a book about the subject of critique. It focuses on a form of subjectivity produced through the imminent activity of critical thought that is, strictly speaking, unlivable. Other current researches include concern, uh, awkwardly phrased on my part, other current researches concern theoretical import of suicide, pessimism, and dandyism. On that note, I will not go into dandyism, which is a separate issue, but he's also half of the, the now burgeoning two person. Uh, theoretical artistic movement, with the other half being me, called the New Pessimism, which is going to sweep Europe, importantly. But <laughs> in the meantime, before that happens, he's also the artist uh, Ludwig Fischer. Um, and uh, Alexa's paper today is just simply called Notes on Lifeless Matter. So, welcome to all. Yeah, thanks, Evan, for that introduction. Um, the paper that I'm going to give. Uh, this afternoon is part of the first book project that Evan mentioned on material science and materialist poetics. And so I don't really deal with uh, material science uh, in this version of the paper, uh, but rather I'm thinking about uh, uh, this book, uh, Crystallography in Relation to Some Sort of Heretical Theories in uh, Evolutionary Biology, um, and their import for thinking about an inorganic poetics. Um, so thanks again uh, to Petta and Tommy Slav and Mama for having us all here. Um, the paper is called The Lucidity of the Unliving, Crystallography and Inorganic Poetry. Among the more tantalizing heresies of evolutionary biology, perhaps in all of science, is the speculative thesis of crystalline ancestry proposed by the Scottish chemist A.G. Karen Smith. It is proposed, he writes, in the opening sentence of his first paper on the subject in 1966, that life on Earth evolved through natural selection from inorganic crystals. Defending this thesis in the 1982 book, Genetic Takeover and the Mineral Origins of Life, Karen Smith argues that in order to account for the emergence of living organisms in carbon-based DNA-RNA replication sequences, evolutionary theory requires a prior, simpler form of replication that could have served as the scaffolding for the gradual assemblage of complex organic macromolecules. He points out that silicon-based crystals, such as those found in ultrafine particles of clay, are excellent candidates for such a scaffolding function, insofar as their structure is copied recursively 
over each atomic layer of their assembly. Because our inorganic crystals spontaneously develop flaws in their structure, which are then replicated over subsequent layers of growth, Karen Smith points out that crystal growth involves a principle of variation and the capacity to pass on heritable traits. He stipulates that the transmission of such heritable traits might be considered a form of genetic information. The theory of crystalline ancestry is based on the possibility that physical properties of these differential structures might then constitute a basis for natural selection. In other words, certain forms of crystalline organization might be more transferable and more conducive to replication than others. These particular variations among crystal structures would therefore have a selective advantage in terms of the probability of their replication. For example, crystal structures that are relatively stable, yet also somewhat brittle, would propagate more widely in stream beds, where currents would cause such crystals to fragment and travel downstream, replicating their structure elsewhere. A structure that was too fragile would disintegrate entirely, while a structure that was too stable would resist fragmentation altogether. But a structure which was somewhat brittle, yet relatively stable, would break into fragments that would retain their organization as they traveled downstream, replicating that organization elsewhere. The crux of Karen Smith's argument is that the presence of organic molecules, which might bond to these crystal structures, could influence their patterns of propagation and selection. The presence of organic molecules could induce differential patterns of crystal growth, and these molecules might therefore become integral components of replication sequences. Fragments of organic molecules may have aided the formation of structures advantageous to propagation and selection, in such a way that the replication of these molecules itself became a selected advantage. From the replication of simple amino acids, more complex organic macromolecules, such as nucleotides and lipids, may thus have co-evolved with crystal structures through processes of selection. This co-evolving replication of inorganic crystals and organic macromolecules would continue until crystal replication was no longer necessary to organic replication. This is the point of what Karen Smith calls genetic takeover. Having gradually co-evolved their own processes of selection and propagation, organic macromolecules would cast off the ancestral crystalline scaffolding that enabled their evolution. And more sophisticated biological mechanisms of DNA replication and protein synthesis would eventually develop. According to Karen Smith, quote, so much had to evolve before our genetic material could have been made, but there must have been some other genetic material to have supported that evolution. The present position of nucleic acids in the metabolic scheme, he argues, can most easily be interpreted as that of a usurper that had come late onto the scene. Um, so you can think of this not only as a theory of genetic takeover, but as a theory of regicide. Right? You can imagine this staged as you know, a hostile corporate takeover film, uh, or as something like Macbeth. Although Karen Smith's work is cited provingly as a promising and ingenious partial theory by Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett, it nevertheless remains speculative and controversial. But regardless of whether it is eventually refuted or proven correct in whatever lacunae it contains, the theory of crystalline ancestry is nothing if not appropriate to the contemporary scientific context in which the fields upon which it relies and draws together, evolutionary biology and crystallography, have been undergoing their own coevolution over the past 70 years. As evolutionary theory has merged with molecular biology, and as the latter has pursued the reduction of life to physical chemistry, it has increasingly been the case that the efforts of molecular biologists to understand the structure and function of biological macromolecules, like proteins in particular, have relied upon techniques borrowed from the study of inorganic crystals. The emergence of molecular biology in the 1930s was substantially enabled by X-ray crystallography, a technique for determining the position of atoms within crystal structures by passing X-rays through them and analyzing the diffraction patterns caused by the interaction of radiation from the X-rays with the regularly organized electrons in the crystal's periodic lattices. And in order to apply this sort of structural analysis to biological molecules, they first have to undergo crystallization. That is, organic molecules have to be grown 
into regular crystal arrays so that their particular structural and functional characteristics as organic molecules can be determined. So molecular biology's conquest of the physical basis of life has demanded the crystallization of the biological and the merger of organic and inorganic chemistry. In order to understand fundamental biological functions, we create and analyze crystal structures. Watson and Crick's determination of the structure of the double helix in 1953, for example, relied upon the crystallographer Rosalind Franklin's diffraction data from her studies of period periodically organized DNA fibers. Uh, the first proteins were modeled by X-ray crystallography in 1958, and as of May 2008, over 40,000 protein structures had been modeled by crystallographers and stored in the online protein data bank. Reflecting upon the relatively recent modeling of the ribosome in a 2001 editorial entitled Wither Crystallography, the journal Nature noted that, quote, the crystallographer's credo that you cannot understand a protein's function without knowing its structure now pervades all of molecular and cellular biology, unquote. From the opposite perspective, one might also add that since the basic geometrical properties of inorganic crystals were more or less understood by the late 19th century, uh, it is molecular biology that has provided crystallography with its raison d'etre over the course of its recent history, effectively expropriating its technical capacities and its research programs. The coevolutionary collusion of inorganic crystals and, bi and biological organisms, the chiasmatic intertwining of biology and crystallography. It's in this speculative and pragmatic context that I want to situate Christian Book's 1994 volume of concrete and procedural poetry, Crystallography. Well, the evolutionary theory of crystalline ancestry draws together organic and inorganic processes of self-replication. And while genetic engineering operates at the intersection of crystallography and molecular biology, Book's experimental poetry explores the application of crystal geometry as a model for poetic form. My argument is that Book's volume exemplifies a mode of poetic writing that is both subtractive and inorganic. It is subtractive insofar as the effort of Book's writing, through the operation of formal and procedural constraints, is to filter out of his work the expressivity of the organic body and the subjective interiority of poetic voice. It is organic insofar as the function of this subtractive operation is not only to filter out the expressive voice of the poet, but also to displace romantic conceptions of organic form associated either with uh, the integral rhythmic coherence of traditional meter or the lyric spontaneity of free verse. Against these models of organic form, Book sutures poetic form to models of inorganic organization and replication drawn from crystallography. Book describes his text as a pataphysical encyclopedia, referring to the so-called science of imaginary solutions, inaugurated by Alfred Jarry, relayed by Marcel Duchamp and the French writers of the Ulipo, and carried forward by Book's friends and mentors in the so-called Toronto Research Group, inaugurated in the 1970s, uh, the poet Steve McCaffrey, B.P. Nichol, and Christopher Dudney. In 1980, in a special issue of the journal Open Letter devoted to pataphysics, Dudney formulated something like his own theory of genetic takeover, which might be understood as a linguistic counterpart uh, to the theory of crystalline ancestry. In his article titled Parasite Maintenance, Dudney proposed that, quote, the evolution of language, inextricably bound with the evolution of our consciousness as a species, has diverged from its parallel independent status with the human species and has become animated. Much like a model of artificial intelligence or a robot, it has taken on a life of its own." Unquote. Here it is language that is the agent of genetic takeover, co-evolving with Homo sapiens until achieving evolutionary autonomy as what he calls a separate intelligence utilizing humans as the neural components in a vast and inconceivable sentience. Unquote. According to Dudney, this encompassing sentience far exceeds the limited purchase of human consciousness, which is restricted by a regime of embedded linguistic habits. Dudney posits, however, that the specialized use, this is a quotation, of linguistic inventions by the poet enables occult access to the autonomous operations of language, 
This is privileged information, he writes, and it places the poet in the same vanguard of research as physics, molecular chemistry, and pure mathematics, unquote. Think of crystallography, the book, as a pataphysical fusion of Karen Smith's and Dudney's evolutionary speculations. Books, poetry operates as if its project were to suture the inhuman autonomy of linguistic intelligence directly to the ancestral pre-biological evolution of the crystal, thereby bracketing the organic enunciation of poetic voice through a kind of crystallographic ventriloquy. In books, volume is the geometric and chemical constraints characterizing the replication of crystal systems uh, that regulates the specialized use of linguistic inventions, which serve as the apparatus, the contextual field, and the pataphysical model through which the poet attempts to evade habitual patterns of usage which restrict cognitive ac ac access to what Dudney calls the vast and inconceivable sentience of language. Crystallography pursues an, an inorganic intertwining of crystalline and linguistic replication for which the neural components of the poet are expropriated by a program of self-organization traversing minerolo mineralogy and poetics. Uh, crystallography opens with a preliminary survey in which the traditionally incantatory invocation of the poetic muse is replaced by uh, the denotative explication of a linguistic sign, the word crystals. The poem on the verso page, on this page, functions as a definition. And I hope you can read this. I'm aware that it's kind of fuzzy. Uh, um, it sort of, it became a little mangled in a transfer to a different uh, PowerPoint program. Um, but I'll read most of the quotations that I'm interested in. So this is the first sentence. Um, uh, it functions as a definition in the first sentence. A crystal is an atomic tessellation. That's the first sentence. Alerts us to the first clause of the first sentence. Alerts us that this will be a book in which the particulate materials of language will exhibit their own self-organizing capacities structural properties and chemical dispositions. The second sentence, uh, a crystal assembles itself out of its own constituent disarray. The puzzle puts itself together, each piece falling as though by chance into its correct location. Um, Gloss's self-assembly is the aleatory emergence of order from the disorder of discrete particles, emphasizing the autonomy of formal organization from intention. Apparently, a natural artifact that rivals the beauty of machine tooled objects. Um, and is therefore easily mistaken for the artificial product of a precision technology, Mark says further down. Uh, the crystal seems paradoxically to be neither naturally nor instrumentally produced, but rather autonomous. It is neither part of a larger organic unity nor fashioned by the directed agency of technical of technical artifice, rather, quote, assembles itself out of its own constituent, uh, constituent disarray. On the facing page, these denotative references uh, of the definition, or the denotative reference of the definition, is effectively concretized, as the word crystals undergoes a process of anagrammatic crystallization, assembling itself out of an assemblage of letters which offer a speculative report on its origins. The words astral salt cast astray, um, but also star, stack, last, ours, and say, are discernible. But the metalinguistic effect of books' concrete poetry is to render the semantic function of these semiological units imminent to their physical organization. The imminence of the meaning of these signs to their material disposition on the page renders the sense of the letters internal to the imperceptible event of their self-assembly into the word crystals at the top of the page. So these are, of course, the letters of the word crystals. Rather than making them dependent upon an external reference, the reader, dutifully making meaning from semantic association, finds the physical substratum of meaning already making and unmaking itself on the page. A diasporic solution of graphemes precipitates the atomic tessellation of the poem's title, while the latter seems to redissolve into a flow of stray particles. Here it seems that meaning is the epiphenomenon of an organization which is already there, on the page, regardless of whether its being there is observed. In crystallography, language is continually diffracting 
into casually recombinant arrays like those that we just looked at, and then tightening into firmer structures. Here, the rule of crystal self-assembly regulates the order of poetic form. The arrangement of the words on the page is periodic, and their spatial distribution is directed by interlocking combinatory patterns of letters on, of letters on the page. Laws of alphabetic bonding dictate that the word lattice must traverse the A of the word crystal and connect with the E of its own reiteration, while the word crystal always intersects with the A of lattice and reconnects uh, with the S or C of another crystal. Shared letters, in this case, substitute for shared electrons, um, occupying what the book calls uh, sweet spaces between words, between atoms, in among them, strong bonds. Crystal's partition space with intersecting arrays of parallel lines, writes book on another page. And these lines, when woven together, form a complex lattice of letters used to build trellises for the ivy of thought. Thus, the words are grids organized according to the graphemic morphology of their spelling, as in this case. Snowflakes in the book spell themselves out as they fall. The letters from which words are assembled are themselves revealed by microscopic analysis to be the products of crystal replication. And the innate crystalline structure of these letters propagates the formation of graphemic fractals, as in the case of this K fractal. While the physical analysis of crystalline structures by biotechnologists enables the modeling of molecular functions, the pataphysical analysis of linguistic particles yields novel models of poetic form. Not content to merely evoke a positive reciprocity between word and crystal, books stress, uh, and these are the two passages that I'm interested in right here, right here. Uh, book sets out to demonstrate uh, the pataphysical validity of this reciprocity. In one instance, he attempts to do so uh, through what he calls the algebraic operations of a mathematical axiology, in which a letter can, quote, become a variable for the value of its position in the alphabet, just as each word can in turn become a relation for the sum of these other words. So in this case, if you unpack using that math uh, mathematical algorithm, um, the value of the letters in the word crystal according to their position in the alphabet, or sorry, word, uh, you get 60, and then if you unpack that um, into the you know, value of the letters in the word diamond, they both equal 60, right? So uh, Book finds a sort of pataphysical analogy compelling. In another instance, the same equivalence is submitted to a geometrical proof, and that's what I had in mind on this side of the page. Here the word diamond refers both to the precious stone, consisting of regular octahedrons of crystallized carbon, and to the geometrical figure that is a plane section of such an octahedral structure. Here, this homographic polysemy uh, looks the same. Right? This homographic polysemy is effectively concretized. The spatial organization of the letters on the page physically constructs the geometrical figure of a diamond, while the proximate evocation of crystal shards activates a denotative reference um, to the precious stone. This doubling of the cumulative function of spatially organized graphemes, whose value is at once concrete, a diamond, right, uh, the geometrical shape, and referential, the precious stone, etc., itself mirrors the double meaning of the written word diamond, extending and amplifying the ambiguity of the word's meaning into the ambiguity of meaning per se, the uncanny co-constitution of semantic and material qualities of language. Book's uh, work contributes not only to the pataphysical tradition stemming from Jari, but also, more specifically, to a line of geologically oriented poetics traceable from Craig Dworkin's recent treatise on tectonic grammar, back through the work of Robert Smithson to William Carlos Williams' mid-century long poem Patterson, or to the second volume of Charles Olson's Maximus poems, a tradition for the most part of American poetry. Give me geology, Olson states in a series of lectures shortly before his death. Then we don't have to worry about soft human history. Steve McCaffrey describes the orientation of his major concrete poem, Carnival, as geomorphic, treating linguistics as akin to plate tectonics, activating linguistic fault lines, cracking open semantic geodes, and operating a realignment of speech, like Earth, for purposes of intelligible access to its neglected properties of imminence and non-reference. 
Christopher Dudney's contribution to this geolinguistic tradition, his 1973 volume, The Paleozoic Geology of London and Ontario, deploys the figure of the fossil as a semiological model. Devoid of perception, the book opens, the blind form of the fossil exists post factum, its movement planetary, tectonic. The flesh of these words disintegrates. The fossil is pure memory, writes Dudeney, as devoid of perception as an engram, a state of semiological imminence requiring no readout. As a radically unintentional inscription or trace of a biological body, the fossil does not index the organism's autonomous agency, its affective expressivity, or its communicative desire. Rather, it indexes the bare fact of its physical existence through the trace of corporeal morphology. McCaffrey reads Dudeney's fossil as, quote, an ellipse in strata, whose extrapolation is the linguistic sign in its state of non-signification, unquote. Crystallography radicalizes this geological semiology by modeling the autonomy of linguistic production upon the crystal's imminent storage of information through its processes of replication. If a fossil records the residual trace of an absent organism's past existence as information, crystal replication involves the autonomous production of information prior to the existence of any organism, whatever. If poets like Olson, McCaffrey, and Dudney cite geology as a semiological figure of poetic signification, Burke literalizes the system of analogy this implies by engaging mineral chemistry as a system of formal constraints regulating the physical construction of the poem. In Emerald, for example, the reference to mineralogy becomes directly structural, as words four elemental components are concretely deployed in the composition of linguistic molecules. Here, the chemical formula for barrel, uh, which is you know, B-E-2-A-L-2-S-I-O-3-6, right? the mineral, which is called emerald, when it includes trace amounts of chromium, um, which result in its green hue. Um, this chemical structure yields three instances of the word beryllium, two of aluminum, six of silicon, and 18 of oxygen, all of which interlock in the verso leaf before undergoing proportionately calibrated permutations on the right-hand side uh, of the volume, right-hand page of the volume. Chromium, for example, morphs into crownland, uh, beryllium into beaumontage, silicon into sidereal, oxygen into opulence, aluminum into alembic, and so on. The quantity of the words in the ode, on the right-hand page, is dictated by the number of elemental atoms in the molecule, while the initial letters of those words are distributed in proportion to those of elemental names, right? So if you have uh, one chromium atom, you're going to get one word which begins with C on the right-hand page. Poems generated from the chemical structure of amethyst, ruby, opal, satire, or sapphire, jade, and topaz are interspersed throughout the volume. I don't know what the chemical structure of satire is. Uh, if, as Book writes elsewhere, crystals are acrostics generated by the stochastics of the cage, and if, as he says, a word is a bit of crystal in formation, then the operative principle of Book's constraint-based concrete poem, uh, in the case of emeralds, is that, as he puts it, the properties of the crystal line are the proper ties for the crystal line. In other words, the formal properties of, crystalline, of crystal geometry furnish Buck's poetry not only with the matter of its mimesis, the imitation of crystal structure through poetic language, but also with its means of poesis, the concrete making of the poem as a material structure. To grasp the subtractive dimension of crystallography's inorganic poetics, Consider Book's tribute to the 19th century crystallographer L.A. Necker. The Necker cube, which you see on the right hand page, is an ambiguous line drawing which, in Book's characterization, quote, exists in two dimensions at the same time while appearing to shift at random back and forth between them without ever seeming to occupy both at once. Here it functions as a figure for the polysemous ambiguity uh, of the homing function of which is described on the facing page. And across the relation between these two pages of the text, 
the ambiguity of either the cube or the homonym becomes doubled by the ambiguity of the relation between them. As the reader's attention flickers between the contextual domains of geometry and semiotics, if the cube, as Boak writes, emulates the form of a photon and the structural ambiguity that it incubates, the sentence, light is not heavy, through its double reference to illumination and relative mass, functions as a polysemic linguistic instantiation of the photon's quantum pun, as Boak puts it. At the conclusion of the final sentence on the right-hand page, um, the semiotic stakes of this kind of polysemous play become more clear. In this case, it is the syntactical position of the word meaningless, which doubles its meaning. Its contextual occupation of a determinate place within the sentence traps the word within the field of its own reference. Because it is the word at the end of this sentence, the semantic meaning of the word recursively cancels itself out through its reflexive application. And because the meaning of the sentence, the meaning of the sentence, I should say, is that the word which concludes it has no meaning, that word becomes meaningless through the self-reference of its own meaning. Quote, delicate words simply dissolve when immersed in their own meaning, Book writes earlier in Crystallography. But in this case, the solubility of semantics precipitates the material obduracy of the word's physicality. Because it comes to mean nothing, we notice the word's intransigent occupation of physical space, the meaningless absorption of light by the black pigment of the ink marking out its constitutive graphemes. The transparency of the word's semantic reference is thus contaminated by the opacity of its material existence. Notably, the word does not dissolve, but its meaning does, undergoing an auto-subtraction along with the hermeneutic reflex of its reader. This subtractive register of the poetics of crystallography functions as a trap, albeit one into which only the most careful reader can properly fall. If we notice the manner in which the physical being of the word meaningless becomes manifest in the poem I've been reading, what we notice is that our capacity to make meaning, to read signs, has been enlisted by, expropriated into, and then erased by the organization of a semiotic apparatus. The supposedly subjective interpretation of meaning is first constrained, captured, and then canceled by the operations of a formal system. In the note titled Lucid Writing that concludes his volume, the book explains that, quote, while the word crystallography quite literally means lucid writing, this book does not concern itself with the transparent transmission of a message, so that, ironically, much of the poetry may seem opaque. Instead, the book concerns itself with the reflexive operation of its own process, in a manner that might call to mind the surreal poetics of lucid dreaming. It's a quotation from this note at the end of the book. The relation between crystallography and poetics in book's volume is pataphysical rather than analogical. Uh, excuse me. Um, it's pataphysical rather than analogical insofar as it does not submit crystal geometry and poetic language to comparison by an observer but rather involves these and the observer within the reflexive operation of its own process, in such a way that the observer is at once drawn into and excised from uh, their collusion. What I am calling the lucidity of the unliving is this properly autonomous reflexivity which, as the theory of crystalline ancestry implies, should be thought as the inorganic medium of replication and reproduction within and through which living organisms come into being. If we think that life is the sort of thing that has meaning, if we think that life is the medium within which the world becomes significant, the vocation of books subtractive inorganic poetics is to make evident that, on the contrary, it is the meaningless lucidity of insignificant organization which constitutes the reflexive medium with, within which the phenomenon called life comes to be in the first place. A crystal book writes, is quote, the flashpoint of a dream intense enough to purge the eye of its infection, sight. Far from rewarding a perceptual faith in the phenomenal or hermeneutic capacities of the organic body or thinking being, the crystal subverts the organism's perceptual faculties. Um, along with its registration and production of significance while capturing its neurological functions within an autonomous dream of the objects 
reflexive duplication. The reflexive mechanism by which the volume foregrounds this neurological capture is called enantiomorphosis, the mirroring of crystal forms through an axis of symmetry. In this table of crystal systems for classifying letters of the alphabet on the basis of axial symmetry, uh, book catalogs um, all the symmetrical axes around which letters can pivot. Um, so for example, in the register of the uh, orthorhombic, right, we have H and I, um, which have uh, three axes of symmetry, etc. So he catalogs the letters of the alphabet according to the same axiology which is used um, for cataloging crystal symmetry. On the previous page, we learned that, quote, a vertical axis makes enantiomers, uh, mirrored forms, um, enantiomers of both B and D, but also P and Q, just as a horizontal axis, right, makes enantiomers not only of B and P, but also of D and Q. Certain letters are themselves constructed by the reflexive operations of interpenetrate twinning, such that, for example, W takes shape at the moment when V twins with its enantiomer through a vertical axis, just as X takes shape at the moment when V twins with its enantiomer through a horizontal axis, if you flip over the V, right, and X. Um, such symmetry is right spot underlie the order of all crystalline forms. Even a palindrome, he points out, quote, is a kind of enantiomer. For example, the phrase mirror rim reveals a sequential symmetry in which the order of letters in one direction repeats itself when reversed. Mirror rim is a palindrome. Each letter is also mirrored in its own structure, the double R, uh, the R double, uh, the letters M, I, O, each symmetrical through a vertical axis the gap between the two words, a flaw in the gem, unquote. The position of both the writer and the reader of crystallography, indeed the position of the organism in relation to its inorganic poetics, is akin to such a gap. The phenomenal constitution of experience and the hermeneutic functions of reading constitute a flaw in the gem of autonomous organization. On the facing page of the K fractal that we looked at earlier, uh, we encounter the following description of our own position vis-a-vis -vis the enantiomorphic relation, the mirrored relation, between mineral and linguistic autoreplication. When two identical mirrors face each other, their cycle of self-reflection recedes forever into an infinite exchange of self-absorption. Each mirror infects itself at every scale with the virus of its own image. Each mirror devours itself at every point with the abyss of its own dream. When we gaze upon a fractal, we must peer in a one-way mirror, unaware of the other mirror standing somewhere far behind us. The organism which observes and interprets, whose neural components are seized by language and enthralled by crystal geometry, is an asymmetric flaw in the enantiomorphic twinning of linguistic intelligence and crystal replication, of concept and object, cognition and matter, thinking and being. The subject of science or the subject of literature, observer, writer, or reader, looks at an image of mineral linguistic replication, an atomic tessellation, a graphemic fractal, all the while unaware of its position in the replicating structure that it looks upon. The paradoxical position, uh, this paradoxical position, of simultaneous inclusion and exclusion wherein the perceiving subject is embodied as a blind spot, is that of the occlusion, a foreign substance absorbed into a crystal structure while remaining an exception to its regularity, deviating from and disturbing the propagation of its symmetrical order. Despite the, quote, aesthetics of structural perfection to which crystallography avowedly aspires, and despite the subtractive rigor of its inorganic formalism, there remains a trace of the organic body that intervenes between the autonomy of crystal replication and that of linguistic intelligence. Even a dream of perfect form must suffer the occlusion of its dreamer. If life is at once self-evident and unthinkable, perhaps that is because it is an occlusion in the symmetrical relation between thinking and being. Writing is the record of that occlusion by which it is both exposed and effaced. Though life, through life, being writes itself as thought. 
thought writes itself as being. Life is that occlusion which cannot think the very concept according to which it is. Life is the occluded asymmetry which intervenes between thinking and being. And writing, inscribing this asymmetry, as we read in crystallography, is, quote, the superficial damage endured by one surface when inflicting damage upon the surface of another.